I'd like to thank Dr. Rabah for the invitation. Uh, as I mentioned, as mentioned, I'm a Lebanese architect with an architecture practice uh, that is based both in uh, Beirut and New York. It's called Left uh, with my partner Ziad Jamal uh, I will start my talk. Uh, with a reference to a 1983 movie by Woody Allen called Zelig, uh, in which Allen plays a nondescript character, Dr. Zelig, who has a pathology of adopting the personality of the people surrounding him, in a way reincarnating himself into the adjacent personality. I will show. Uh, I think the idea is that when he uh, goes next to a French guy, he adopts a kind of a fake uh, uh, French accent. When he is next to a Chinese guy, he uh, develops uh, Asian traits. So this idea somehow of the mockumentary uh, represents the identity crisis of many minorities in the Middle East. It was seen at the time as a representation of Jewish, Jewish angst and paranoia. But for minorities in the Middle East, paranoia can potentially be a productive endeavor and undertaking. Uh, the silver lining is that this fear on, is of, the ver, uh, of being on the verge of extinction provides an impetus to achieve one's bucket, bucket list. It also provides a conceptual clarity beyond overarching hegemonic tendencies that might plague other majorities. The challenge for minorities has historically been the degree to which they uh, either integrate in or segregate from a larger identity, be it national, uh, ethnic, religious, or other. The interesting thing about Lebanon specifically is that, in fact, we are all minorities with varying degrees. In that, in that sense, the word diversity in the title of the symposium can be understood not by defining an us versus an other, which is an external way to look at diversity from without, but by showing that the other, this other that we're talking about, is not one dogmatic monolith, but a series of many subdivisions that overlap with us. It is looking at diversity from within that is of interest to our architectural practice, which tries to deconstruct the myth of majority and minority, of homogeneity and of purity, through the practice of architecture and through sometimes the search not only for what unites us, but for what subdivides us further into these overlapping identities. Dr. Zelig, in that sense, becomes a symbol of conformity within a larger whole and an exception to that whole at the same time. The focus for me in this talk is the overlap of religious identities with the space of architecture, and I will be discussing this in parallel with a series of small architectural histories and narratives that I will reflect on, all pertaining to that space where architecture, politics, and religion collide and inter intersect. Uh, our interest in the religious space of architecture sl started by looking more attentively at the space it occupies within the city or its geopolitics. The seeming coexistence of mosques and churches in Lebanon beholds a continuous turf war between the different religious institutions. Beirut city center claims the highest density of religious buildings per square meter in the world, with dozens of churches and mosques and one synagogue recently renovated. Dictated not by a demographic demand for more religious buildings, this density is, symbolic, is a symbolic and territorial competition to mark each religion's political presence. One can only read the construction of Al-Amin Mosque, starting in 2002, as a response 30 years later to the Lady of Lebanon Basilica in Harissa, whose design was inspired both, uh, by both J the Japanese architects Tekenzo Tange's uh, St. Mary Cathedral in Tokyo, but also his Olympic Stadium, which is a more befitting reference since religion in Lebanon is the country's national sport. <laughs> the Al-Amin Mosque... <laughs> the Al-Amin Mosque marked uh, al uh, urbanistically, albeit not architecturally, the paradigm shift in Lebanon in Lebanese politics from a Christian-dominated political system to one that is still sectarian and confessional in essence, yet predominantly Muslim. In 2010, as yet another response, the biggest illuminated cross in the world was erected in Khanat Bakish. It was supposed to claim the title of the biggest cross uh, in the world, but the cross in Latin America was deemed higher, so the Lebanese decided to reclaim it as the biggest lit cross. <laughs> if religious identity is not shaped by architecture, it is certainly shaping our architecture. Within this architectural narrative, the Druze religious space, or the Khalwa, is out of the competition from the onset. If we look architecturally at the urban placement of the church versus that of the mosque, we can see that the church, uh, the church has historically been a mid-space object to be looked at from a distance. This is in relationship to a main public space where the crowds can gather after mass. 
whereas the mosque had a different relationship that is more integrated with the city fabric, or what we call uh, uh, urban morphology. So it is a relationship that is still architecture, b- but inwardly so. The khalwa, on the other hand, is not even architecturalized as an object, but interiorized and covert due to the histories of oppression that the Druze have endured. So one cannot speak of a a Druze architecture per se, as it can be anywhere. It can be here, it can be here, it can be anywhere, basically. In relationship to the Christian square and the uh, Islamic courtyard, interiorized courtyard. Few exceptions obviously exist. Uh, but the mainstream, this is in Hasbaya, but the mainstream is still an average interior space that is nondescript, like Dr. Zelig, covert and invor- inverted typologically. Uh, a part of our work has since been focusing on the architecture of uh, Islam, and, and I will focus my presentation on the design that we did for the Amir Shakib Arslan, uh, which will come later, but I will present it as a continuity of a research that started in 2011 on the architecture of Islam, and that led to the mosque's design in 2016, and has since sprung out and continued after its construction, which uh, still, uh, and the research that still pro- pre- occupies us today. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, Islam as a religion, uh, it's the fastest growing uh, religion in the world with, with some estimates of a 2.9% growth annually, projected by, that, by 2025 to be the biggest religion in the world. Uh, in terms of uh, demographics, uh, it's a bottom-heavy religion, meaning that there are way more youth to the religion than, for, for example, Christianity or uh, uh, Judaism, but in terms of, uh, uh, anyone would expect that uh, with this uh, bottom-heavy religion, that the amount of experimentation uh, for the youth with architecture of the of the mosque, which is, of the Islam, which is the mosque, one would see a lot of more experimentation that is happening. Specifically, for example, with recent examples uh, such as the previously shown Al Amin Mosque, which uh, derives uh, its uh, uh, shape from uh, early Ottoman, uh, uh, the Blue Mosque, for example, in uh, 1600. 1609. Uh, surprisingly, uh, because uh, architecturally there's no specific typology for, um, for what a mosque uh, could, should be, the dome, the minaret, uh, are all uh, not neither in the Quran nor in the Hadith. So, for example, even the orientation towards Mecca uh, wasn't always the case. Earlier examples of mosques were oriented towards Jerusalem. Uh, so none of these typologies that we take for granted are uh, specific to uh, the religion, but car- are kind of are more social, social constructs uh, construct a- as the religion developed. Uh, the minarets are uh, developments of church, ta- bell- church bell towers uh, or even uh, synagogue towers. The dome itself is uh, a development on earlier uh, Hagia Sophia, for example, but it was, was taken by the architect Sinan and developed further to become more buoyant, uh, admitting more light into the space of the mosque. Uh, these are uh, uh, recent examples of contemporary mosques that are being built around the world. This is on the Asian uh, part of Istanbul by Erdogan. This is uh, Putin inaugurated the mosque in uh, uh, Moscow, and even the uh, Sheikh Zayed Mosque in Abu Dhabi. That was not always the case. I mean, in earlier, in the days of uh, 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 Arab nationalism or pan-Arabism, uh, where the, the politics of the Arab world were more open-minded and uh, more uh, uh, kind of pushing the envelope uh, politically, it reflected on the architecture of the city itself and, and the architecture of the mosque. So these are examples of more modern mosques that were built. For example, this is Aisha Bakkar Mosque in Beirut in, uh, in the 70s by ja- Jafar Tukhan. This led us to, to kind of the uh, researching on, uh, on the uh, translation of the word mosque in Arabic. And y- you have two options for that translation, either a jamia or a masjid. Uh, obviously, jamia is from the word uh, jama, which is a gathering place, versus masjid is more about the prostration, so it's more liturgical in nature. Uh, but the idea of the jamia is that the, the mosque could go beyond uh, the dogmatic religious space, but it could open up to the city programmatically and otherwise. Uh, this is the premise of a studio that we gave in 2011 at Yale, uh, where we took the site in Tripoli, and we kind of uh, produced a book out of it, uh, reclaiming or redefining what a mosque could be for the 21st century. Uh, we called it the expanded mosque uh, because the, our idea was to think about the mosque in terms of its porous nature uh, and not its kind of sacred dogmatic nature, uh, which uh, uh, kind of uh, re- relates to the idea of programmatic hybridity to the mosque itself. 
uh, students, uh, for example, worked uh, on redefining the, the typology through the use of water and water activities, through the use of agriculture, through the use of different lights that would come at different prayer times in the day, turning it into a uh, museum for Islamic uh, art, for example. So something that is an uh, architecture of the mosque plus something else. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, we did also, uh, we, based on an invitation, we did uh, for the Prague Quadrennial um, in 2011 also, we took at the time uh, what was uh, a ban on uh, uh, Islamic minarets in Switzerland. This is a poster uh, from that campaign. Uh, only four were built in Switzerland, and they kind of established the ban for uh, minaret construction afterwards. But we took these four minarets and we grafted them onto uh, a 1980 Venice, Pavil uh, Venice Biennale uh, pavilion, which is a floating theater. We grafted these minarets onto the theater. It's a theoretical speculative project, obviously. But uh, the idea was to kind of take this floating mosque and create a map of uh, uh, an imaginary travel that would go from the Middle East. Uh, this is a map of the Mediterranean. So this is it. It's kind of reversed, so it's hard to read a little bit. But uh, uh, the idea of taking this mosque from the Middle East uh, on a journey towards uh, Europe, kind of playing on the uh, resurgent at the time, uh, Islamophobia that was uh, uh, finding foot in, in Europe. Uh, so the idea was to kind of create a degree zero mosque, which is the simplest mosque that one can have, which is the carpet and uh, suing it in Turkey, I think, at the time we did it. Uh, anyway, we got a commission in 2015 from MP Walid Jumbla to build a mosque in the village of Mukhtara. Uh, eventually, it got called the Amir Shakib Arslan, but during our design, uh, uh, the name was still in flux. Uh, the village of Mukhtara, obviously, uh, there's a palace, the 18th century palace that you see in the picture here. which is uh, uh, kind of in, in close proximity to the mosque itself. But the interesting thing about uh, the village itself is that it housed uh, in the 18th century a mosque uh, in Hay al Masihiyye now. So it's a different location than the mosque we eventually built. Uh, that was built by Bashir, a mosque that was built by Bashir Jumblat and uh, destroyed by Bashir Shahab uh, based on their uh, kind of feud at the time. Uh, but in another interesting uh, 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 religious space is the Maronite Church. Uh, and there's an interesting story about it because it shows the pluralistic nature of the Druze uh, villages in general that housed many mosques. The idea here be, uh, was the myth, or I, I mean, it's, I don't know if it's true or not, but uh, uh, this is an interesting story because at one point the Khazin family who, would, who were friends with Sheikh Bashir would always come on Saturday night and spend kind of uh, the whole night at uh, the palace, but eventually always having to leave back to their village because they had to attend prayer on Sunday. So the prin uh, Prince Bashir decided to build a church for them so they can stay over till Sunday. And that shows kind of the non-dogmatic nature of the relationship between the different communities in, in uh, Mount Lebanon specifically, I guess, in Lebanon in general. Uh, th that was much more fluid than it is now. This is the site that we were given at the beginning of the design project. Uh, the Zaytuni was an existing uh, uh, tree on one side and a fountain, 18th century fountain, on the other side. We started by taking a gener the gener generic uh, uh, box dome mineral typology and, and creating an abstraction to the shape of the uh, mosque itself, more of a transparent veil that would go over the existing masonry cross-vaulted space uh, inside. So this is the space of the mosque here. And we added this uh, tectonic veil on top of it. The idea was to take uh, the, again, this generic box dome, dome and mineral typology and uh, transforming it and hybridizing it into a modern abstraction of uh, different tectonic elements. All these tectonic elements were created in the direction of Mecca specifically, but none of them uh, form elements that are in the direction of Mecca. So they are all uh, forming concave arcs. Uh, portraying the outwardly embracing nature of religion. Uh, this is the project as it was uh, built eventually. The idea is that it's a kind of a veil that wraps uh, next to, above, and uh, adjacent to the concrete, uh, the stone masonry uh, vaults, creating three gates: uh, one at the level of the, at the scale of the uh, mosque itself, one as an entry to the uh, tomb of Kamal Jumblat, and another entry to the uh, space of the offices uh, and the new plaza we created above. We took out one of the floors that were recently added. Uh, 
the ablution space is uh, uh, kind of a, um, a channel from the Baruch River. So we created kind of a, a contextual uh, project uh, from different angles. Uh, these are drawings that we've created. We've added a piazza in front of the mosque where, where a parking used to sit. And we linked basically this piazza to the historic fountain at the entry of the mosque. Uh, a couple of uh, this is a kind of a drawing that uh, uh, depicts the uh, kind of a, a collapsing of the plan and uh, and elevation in the tradition of Islamic representation. I'm going to go a little bit quicker. Uh, this is the aerial showing the uh, fountain, the skylight above that brings lights to to the inside of the mosque. A uh, couple of quick photos. One of the interesting things that we wanted to uh, address is the idea that Muhammad Arkun discussed in his book Al-Ansana wal-Islam, basically that the European Enlightenment project of the 18th century was based on the humanism of Islam. So the idea, the Western idea of uh, mutually exclusiveness between uh, Islam and modernity was challenged in this book. We took that and we created the word insan, which on one hand... Uh, uh, re relates to this idea of humanism, of Islam, but also creates kind of a dialectic relationship with God, uh, kind of the human-God relationship that Hegel, Hegel talks about. But the idea is that also uh, man is uh, in service of God as much as, or maybe to a lesser degree, whatever, whatever you want to put it, uh, as God is in service of man also. Uh, the idea also, uh, we created kind of a three-dimensional uh, calligraphy. So the uh, word insan here and Allah here are based on a structural uh, manipulation of the tectonic elements. And specifically the word Allah, if you see it from one angle, you see it as a solid. If you see it as from another angle, it disappears, uh, addressing the idea of God as an idea or a concept or an abstracted idea. Uh, if you look at it frontally, the mosque becomes also this ethereal uh, transient presence. Uh, on the inside, uh, we collaborated uh, for the carpets. Uh, we, we kind of collaborated with an artist called Lawrence Abu Hamdan uh, to create kind of an echography of the call to prayer. So this is a call to prayer translated into an imagery. Uh, the mihrab itself is at the same time uh, uh, kind of pointing to the, towards the direction of Mecca, which... By law, you can vary it, again, 15 degrees off of Mecca, so you can be wrong by 15 degrees. And it, again, shows kind of the idea that you, uh, religion is not as dogmatic as we would like it to believe, uh, or, or people tend to believe. But the idea, again, is that the mahrab, although it kind of is very monodirectional, uh, through the mirror reflection of it uh, in terms of materiality, it uh, gives us uh, multiple directions uh, uh, off the bat. Uh, we worked also with Nisreen Khudr, who's here on the call to prayer itself, but uh, eventually it wasn't used. The idea, again, was to kind of create a visual relationship between the inside of the mosque and the exterior of the mosque. Uh, one, once you're inside, you can look out and see the minaret where the sound is coming from. Uh, the idea, again, also for the uh, temporary separation of gender. And this is something that we were against at the beginning, but uh, Dar al-Fatwa insisted on it, so we abided. Uh, another aspect of the mosque on the inside uh, was drawn from the theologian and anthropologist Yusuf Siddiq, who addresses the, uh, the, the word Iqra uh, as the first word of the Quran, Iqra bismi rabbika. And the idea uh, behind this is that uh, had God wanted us to recite blindly the Quran, he would have said recite. But the idea of uh, having said uh, read in, uh, in the name of your God, reading entails a post-structuralist uh, understanding of the Quran as a text rather than a meta-narrative, uh, and hence prone to interpretation. Uh, so we adopted this uh, word uh, as an embossing in the uh, wood uh, at the back of the mosque where usually the reading uh, occurs. This is from the opening. It was on the cover of the Architect magazine, which is the uh, main uh, magazine for architects in the U.S. Uh, at the time when Trump was uh, pushing for his Muslim ban. Uh, the mosque itself was built by different uh, craftsmen from different religions, so it attests to the fact that architecture is inherently an ecumenical project. Uh, I, I don't know if I have time, but I will show quickly a research that we've been doing since 2016 also. Uh, it's called City of Islams, and it uh, portrays on, one, on a single map 14 years of mosque architecture. So you have uh, from the days of the Prophet till contemporary times, and when you put them on the same map, 
Uh, I'll show quickly, kind of zoom in. Uh, this is Harawin, the oldest uh, university in the world. A uh, couple of examples from the, for the Uyghurs in China, for uh, a mosque in uh, Tehran. So we kind of map them all in their context. So what was interesting for us, if we look at these all together, it shows us, I mean, it shows, showed us four things in, uh, in hindsight. The idea that uh, as we move, as religion moved towards contemporary times, you can notice the scale of the mosque started very small and then became opulent and more uh, grandiose. Uh, the context, since we drew, we drew the context also, uh, the mosque was much more integrated in its context uh, versus becoming more uh, the mosques that we, we've seen for the uh, uh, kind of a sta state mosque, what are they what they're called, state mosque. Uh, the third thing is, in, again, programmatically, how the mosque was much more integrated, uh, going back to the idea of the jamia, versus now they're much bigger, but they're only liturgical and and, and programmatically. Uh, and the fourth and more important things, uh, w once we set the north, uh, uh, kind of related them all to the north on top of the map, you notice that a mosque that would be, for example, located in the US is facing Mecca while an, uh, in one direction, while a uh, mosque facing Russia would be in the other direction. So inherently ar and architecturally, uh, the quality of the light uh, negates the idea of one architecture for Islam. So it's much more pluralistic that what, uh, when, than what we're led to believe. Uh, we took this uh, research to also in 2016 and then in Turkey uh, in 2017, I think. And uh, I think that's it. I'm going to move quickly. Uh, I want to finish uh, just by a couple of uh, sentences. Uh, the idea that uh, I think, I mean, the, import, the importance of architecture is that it, it, through its abstraction and through its program, it can really transcend what the specificity of the religion can be. And I think uh, the message that we are trying to portray architecturally is uh, both addressed to the West that uh, perceives Islam uh, and uh, all the subdivisions of Islam as a monolith uh, versus an Orient that also perceives the subdivisions as a, th as a threat. So I think this uh, idea of uh, intersecting and overlapping identities is a richness that should be preserved. Thank you.